Welcome back team to general chemistry chapter 10 and we're going to be talking about acids and bases. So we're going to start off with 10.1 where we talk about the definitions. So we have Arrhenius acids and bases. So Arrhenius acids dissociate to produce an excess of hydrogen ions in solution whereas the bases dissociate to produce an excess of hydroxide ions uh, in solution. So Arrhenius is limited to aqueous solutions, and that's really important to know. So if you have solids or gases or liquids, they won't uh, be accounted for in Arrhenius uh, solutions. So for an acid here, we have HCl aqueous, and it dissociates in water to produce H plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. Same thing with base, so NaOH will dissociate in water to produce Na plus and OH minus. With bronsted Lowry acids, we have species that can donate hydrogen ions, and that's usually water. And with bronsted Lowry bases, we have species that can accept these hydrogen ions. So that's your hydroxide ions, your NH3, uh, or F minus. And these are not limited to aqueous solutions. So we have a hydronium ion with an oxygen and three hydrogens around it that will happily donate one of its hydrogen ions to the hydroxide ion on the right. Next we have the Lewis acids and bases. So the Lewis acids are electron pair acceptors, whereas the Lewis bases are electron pair donors. The electron pair donated is a lone pair and is not involved in other bonds. And we have the example here of the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion. Moving on to amphoteric, and these are species that can behave as an acid or a base. But when we have amphiprotic, these are amphoteric species that specifically can behave as bronsted Lowry acid or bronsted Lowry bases. So when O2 reacts with a base, where we indicate as B-, it behaves as an acid. So the H2, that, which behaves like an acid, will donate the hydrogen ion. So H2O plus the base will create a conjugate acid, which is HB. So that's a hydrogen ion from the water molecule from the reactants. And that will accept the hydrogen ion. So it will create a conjugate acid, HB plus OH minus. And that would be the, your conjugate base. However... If H2O was to react with an acid that we show as HA, it'll behave like a base. So we have H2O, that's the base, and it reacts with an acid, HA, it will create a H3O plus plus A minus. So the hydronium ion in this scenario will be the conjugate base because it'll accept that hydrogen ion from the acid. And the A minus will end up being your conjugate base. So hydroxides of certain metals such as Al, Zn, Pb, and Cr are also amphoteric. Moving on to acid and base nomenclature. For the first part, we see that acids formed from anions with the names that end in ide. So we have fluoride, chloride, and bromide. Once we add an H in front of them, we start naming them with hydro and then the name of the element we then drop the ide and add the ic acid at the end. So for fluoride, we will add hydro in the front, fluor, and drop the ide and add ic, so hydrofluoric acid. And we do the same for HCl, so hydrochloric acid and hydrobromic acid. Then we have the acids formed from oxyanions, which are called oxyacids. So just have a look over this and Make sure you're comfortable and familiar with naming each of these. The best way that worked for me was making flashcards, but uh, whatever works for you, make sure you have these names down. Moving on to 10.2, we're going to talk about properties. So autoionization is when water reacts with itself. So when we have water plus water, we'll get a hydronium ion plus a hydroxide ion. And the water dissociation constant we represent with Kw. So the equation is Kw is equal to the concentration of hydronium ion times the concentration of hydroxide ion, which is equal to 10 to the power of negative 14 at 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. So this is dependent 
only on temperature. And when we break down the concentration for each, um, we take 10 to the negative 14 divided by 2. So each concentration is equal to 10 to the negative 7 moles. Next we have pH and pOH. So we use pH when discussing hydrogen ions. So pH is equal to negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, which is also equal to the positive log of 1 over hydrogen ion. And we do the same thing for pOH, but instead we use the hydroxide ions. And when we add both pH and pOH together, we should get 14. So good things to keep in mind are that the log of 1 is equal to 0 and the log of 10 is equal to 1. Moving on to strong acids and bases, which completely dissociate in aqueous solutions and have very weak inert conjugates. So we have NaOH, which will dissociate into Na plus plus OH minus. So we have 1 mole of each, and the pH and OH can be calculated. So we know that the combination of the pH and pOH are supposed to equal 14. So we can write that pH is equal to 14 minus pOH. And we can insert the equation for pOH, which is negative log of the hydroxide concentration. The negative and negative become positive, so it's 14 plus log of 1 mole, because we have 1 mole of hydroxide ion. And we know that the log of 1 is equal to 0, so 14 plus 0 is equal to 14, and that's the pH. Now to find the pOH, we take the combination of the two, which is 14, minus the pH value that we calculated before. So 14 minus 14 gives us a pOH of 0. For weak acids and bases, they don't completely dissociate in solutions and have corresponding dissociation constants, so Ka and Kb. Ka would be your acid, and Kb would be your base. And they also have weak conjugates. For acid dissociation constant, Ka, we have water plus an acid, so Ha, which will dissociate into hydronium and A-. And we can write that as Ka is equal to products of a reactant, so we have our H3O plus with A- over Ha. Don't add H2O in the equation because that's just a neutral element here. And we do the similar thing for base dissociation constant, but instead of Ka, we will have Kb. So same thing happens. We write our base in the denominator and our products in the numerator. So the dissociation constant, which is Kw, is Ka, your acid, times the Kb, which is a conjugate base, That'll give you your Kw, and that's equal to 10 to the power of negative 14. Remember in the examples above that the base or an acid will create the opposite conjugates. So for an acid, you'll have a conjugate base, and with a base, you'll have a conjugate acid. Next, we move on to chapter 10.3, where we talk about the polyvalence and normality. An equivalent is defined as one mole of the species of interest, like we talked about before. So acids use moles of hydrogen ion as an equivalent, and bases use the moles of hydroxide ions as an equivalent. So normality is a concentration of acid-base equivalents in a solution. And in the example that we have here, it's asking, what is the normality of 2 moles of AlOH3 or 16 moles of H2SO4? So when we have two moles of AlOH3, we're going to dissociate that with Al3 plus plus hydroxide ions. And once we balance that out, we know that there's three moles of hydroxide ions in the products. So we'll go normality is equal to two moles times the three moles because that's the amount of hydroxide ions that we have. And that gives us 6n. And that's our answer for the first half of the question. For H2SO4, we dissociate that into 1 mole of HO42- minus plus 2 moles of H plus ions. Because there's 2 moles, we use the normality equation, plug in 16M times 2M, and we should get 
32N, and that's her final answer. For polyvalent, acids and bases are those that can donate or accept multiple electrons. The normality of a solution containing a polyvalent species is the molarity of the acid or base times the number of protons it can donate or accept. So common polyvalent acids would be H2SO4, H3PO4, and H2CO3. Just keep those in mind. And then the common polyvalent bases would be ALOH3, CAOH2, and MGOH2. And moving on to 10.4, we're going to talk about the titration and buffers. So titrations are used to determine the concentration of a known reactant in a solution. A titrant has a known concentration and is added slowly to find the titrant to reach the equivalence point. A titrant, however, has an unknown concentration but a known volume. At the equivalence point, the number of equivalents of acids and base are equal. This fact allows us to calculate the unknown concentration of the titrant, and we do this with Na times Va is equal to Nb times Vb. So the N is the acid and base normalities, and A is for acid, B is for base, and the V values are acid and base volumes. The half equivalence point is the midpoint of the buffering region in which half of the titrant has been protonated or deprotonated, and thus your HA is equal to A minus, and a buffer is formed. The equivalence point is indicated by the steepest slope in the titration curves, and it is reached when the number of acid equivalents and the original solution equal the number of base equivalents added or vice versa. So here we have a small table. So if we have a strong acid and a strong base, our equivalence will be pH is equal to 7. With a weak acid and a strong base, our pH will be greater than 7. And with a strong acid and a weak base, our pH will be less than 7. And with both weak acid and base, the pH may be above or below 7. And that's depending on the relative strength of the acid and base in question. And then we have indicators. And these are weak acids and bases that display different colors in their protonated or deprotonated forms. The indicators chosen for titration should have a pKa that's close to the p of the expected equivalence point and the endpoint of a titration is when the indicator reaches its final color. So buffer solutions consist of a mixture of weak acids or bases and its salt which is composed of its conjugate base or acid and an anion or cation and they resist large fluctuations in pH. Next we have is the buffering capacity, which refers to the ability of a buffer to resist the changes in pH. So the maximum buffering capacity is seen within one pH point of the pKa of the acid in the buffer solution. We're going to move on to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, where it quantifies the relationship between the pH and pKa for the weak acids and between the pOH and pKb for weak bases. So when a solution is optimally buffered, the pH is equal to pKa and pOH is equal to pKb. Here we have the two equations for the acids and the base. So we have the pH or pOH is equal to the pK plus the log. And then we have the conjugates on the top and the weak acid or base at the bottom. So when conjugate base is equal to the weak acid, we know that pH is equal to pKa because log 1 is equal to 0. And we can say the same thing for the conjugate acid equal to the weak base, where pOH is equal to pKb because the log of 1 is equal to 0. And that brings us to the end of chapter 10. I hope to see you guys in chapter 11. Take care.